Welcome, everyone. We'll get started with tonight's Sitka Talk in just a minute or two as folks are logging on. And greetings, everyone. My name is Allison Dennis. I serve as Executive Director for the Sitka Center for Art and Ecology, and it is a pleasure to welcome you to tonight's resident talk. Sitka is located at Cascade Head on the North Central Oregon coast and resides on the unceded traditional lands of the indigenous people now represented by the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ron and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. There is so much to learn as just uh, one recommended step we can take, especially when we are planning a visit to Sitka or staying on the coast, just really encourage you to visit the Grand Ron Chichalu Museum and Cultural Center this year. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the first of tonight's residents. Dennis Rodriguez and Leonardo Remor are artists, curators, and researchers. They reflect on art and nature with projects focused on rural areas, the land, ancestral knowledge, and technologies of indigenous peoples of Eastern South America. They are the founders of Miranche Shiki Shiki, a para institution that promotes research residencies in different areas of environment, architecture, cuisine, and the arts. The nonprofit's organ uh, the nonprofit organization's mission is to safeguard the architectural and cultural heritage around it. They also create films, photography, objects, and installations, reflecting on anthropology and questioning Western ethnography. Dennis and Leo usually reside in Brazil, but tonight they are with us at the Sitka Center, and we're so glad they are. Wherever you are, make some joyful noise and help welcome Dennis and Leo to Sitka. Uh, thanks. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm Dennis Rodriguez, and I'm Leonardo Remor. Together, we are the Brazilian duo Rodriguez Remor. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to everybody tonight. Um, uh, we have been working together since 2013. Uh, this is the location uh, where we live. Uh, we live in Bahia State, northeast of Brazil. Uh, we live in a national park called Chapada Diamantina, in a really small community of 400 people called Igatu, which in Guarani language means good water. Uh, this region, a uh, hundred years ago, was the most important diamond mining place in Brazil. Igatu is a true living museum of diamond mining history in Brazil. And what catches the eye is the local architecture. As you are seeing this slide, it's uh, locally called the Stokas. Stokas are old stone houses built by miners using large boulders and flagstones and also the remnants of the rocks of the mining where they used to build their house. Uh, and we are interested in all these ideas of permaculture and bioconstructions, uh, all these ideas that were already there in those ways of living and housing from the miners. So after moving to this small village, um, we started this project called Mirante Chique Chique, which is a place, also a community uh, that encourages and facilitates research uh, in the national park. We promote uh, residencies, not just for artists, but from for researchers from other fields, like curatorial studies, writing, architecture, music, and we welcome any people that would like to spend more time close to the National Park and to the community of Igatu. It's important to say that our we don't see any separation between our work running this uh, institution and our artistic practice um, that comprehends films, installation, sculptures, and more recently, ceramics. In ceramics, we are interested in the combining different uh, media. Uh, this is a photo from our last installation uh, that was commissioned for the Panorama of Brazilian Art from the Museum of Modern Art in Sao Paulo. And it's a video installation that combines film, ceramics, and audio uh, 
it's a rel relational video installation that invites visitors uh, to learn more about Dagmar's uh, production ceramics and life story. Dagmar was an artist, a ceramist from Bahia, and she represents the continuation of traditional pottery in Brazil. Uh, she used to produce manually uh, coil building, the largest vessels where she inscribed her own life stories. We spent two years visiting Dagmar, learning from her, and um, doing this documentary that in the end we decided to show as uh, eight different monitors. Uh, so it was a film that was, there was no final editing. People were invited to stay there, to, uh, to listen to all these stories from her family, her neighbors, and people that know her and create uh, their own narrative about Dagmar's stories. And from Dagmar, we want to, to share another work, uh, because in the region that we live, uh, we live in a place, uh, in a region, that there is a corridor of cave paintings. Uh, it's a large, a large area where uh, more than 100 uh, cave painting sites uh, are located in Brazil. Some of them are not even mapped by public authorities. Uh, so what we like about this is the opportunity to visit, to register, to document, and to create an archive. And, and, from, and from there, we are able to fictionalize and bring these paintings to three-dimensional space. So first, uh, with etern eternal presence, those images, those two previous slides, and after with ceramics uh, in eternal present uh, where we print uh, the cave painting photos uh, into fabric uh, where the idea is to reproduce physically uh, uh, the physicality of the caves but also uh, we try to do it using ceramic as, as well so uh, we are working a lot with a site uh, of cave paintings called Paridas, where we are working on a immersive installation with ceramics and light metals, like in this slide. So I'm creating an, an installation that is completely anchored in reference of pre-Columbian imagery. Uh, so this work is our way to question why European Im imagery is still prevails in the art world. Uh, we like to imagine what would be, would be a genuine American imagery, what would be an American visual lexicon. So how would the world and the art world, if the colonizer, instead of killing and impose their culture, they have decided to live and learn from the native cultures. And then I would like to uh, talk a little bit about this video piece that we did after Dagmar uh, inscribing in the vessel. We, we start a collaboration with two writers. We collaborate, the two of us, but we love um, sharing with other artists and other people. So we start uh, sharing these videos that we took during our walks in the National Park. So they are really simple. They are small happenings that we find, we found on nature. So we start sharing them with these friends that they live uh, in the same village that we live. And then they start to respond uh, to this video image with poems, with text. And we did those spots that they were projecting. So the video and the image were coming from inside of these spots. So it's uh, still working uh, in progress. Uh, we are trying to organize a full installation with this work. So this is our uh, current work. So I think this is uh, our last words as well, because I represent so many works. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having us.
Thank you so much, Dennis and Leo. We're so uh, pleased to have you with us. Our next presenter is Jiyun. Jiyun is an interdisciplinary artist based in Chicago. Her background includes facilitation, grant writing, quilt making, teaching, union activism, and community organizing. Her current body of work uses walking as a medium to witness the ongoing structures of settler colonialism and racial capitalism in urban built environments. Welcome, Jian. We look forward to seeing you exploring your walking practice here uh, in Sitka's natural spaces. And I'm a grant writer too. Great to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for having me here in the week that I've been here. I've walked many, many steps and it's been, I feel very honored and lucky and privileged to, to get to be in this space and to be around such uh, fabulous artists and writers. So let's see. So yes, I have a varied background. I've done lots of different things and walking is the latest iteration of things I've been interested in. Part of that reason is uh, my early life. I uh, moved around a lot. I am Korean, um, but I was actually born in Japan. My father was in the diplomatic service for South Korea at the time, a very short-lived career, but we started in, I started in Japan, we moved to Korea and then Stockholm and Sweden and then England. My dad quit. He wanted to study. We came to Chicago when I was nine years old and I grew up mostly there. And then in my twenties lived in uh, New York and in San Francisco, and then eventually made it back to Chicago. So this experience of living in so many different places, countries, cultures, languages had a big effect. When we first moved to Chicago, it was 1980. I was nine years old. And where we lived was on the north side, which looked like this. Multi-ethnic, multiracial, lots of immigrants, mostly working class and lower middle class. Where my mom could figure out to make money was this, which was a women's clothing store on the south side of Chicago in a poor and working class Black neighborhood in Bronzeville, for those of you who are familiar with Chicago, which is the heart of what was called the Black Belt during the Great Migration when African Americans moved north from the south of the U.S. And those were two very different worlds. This was a very different world than this. And I had always tried to figure out where we were. And this was just one of the places where no one no one talked about why things were the way they were. And we just navigated these different neighborhoods and different urban environments just, you know, as part of life, as you do when you're an immigrant. You just take what what's there. Many, many, many years and careers and sort of lives later, I decided that I really wanted to focus on art making. And I got to go to an MFA program in Detroit. And I had never spent time in Detroit, and it was very discombobulating. And part of it, I realized, was because it was the first time I was living somewhere new as an adult. I had to figure out where I was. And I was in a fiber program. I had done lots of work with textiles and quilt making, so that's why I went. Um, but it was an interdisciplinary kind of place, and they let me walk. And somebody I met who had grown up in Detroit and lived there all his life told me about how even though most of the roads are in a grid system, that there were these large radial roads that cut across the grid and that they were all or mostly all roads that Native people had created before white settlers came. So that made me curious and I started researching and then I thought, well, I could walk that. Walking had always been a way for me to figure out, literally figure out where am I? And so that was the first big walking project I did. These five radial roads for 25 miles each, which took between 10 and 11 hours. 25 miles was just somewhat arbitrary number, but it's a, it's a good, it's, it was good for Detroit because it meant that you could go from the heart of downtown through the city 
through the suburbs and in some cases out to the outer edge of the suburbs. I also did a related walking set of around the borders of certain suburbs that had particular resonance. Dearborn and Inkster are linked by the legacy of Henry Ford and the Ford Motor Company. Bloomfield Hills is one of the wealthiest suburbs in the entire United States, and it was the location of the art school that I went to, Cranbrook Academy of Art. So walking through all these very disparate kinds of places, any of you who have spent any time in any city know that there are places that uh, where you can see, literally see the lack of investment and the lack of care in a place contrasted with some place, um, with places that look like this, gated communities, manicured lawns. As I was walking, well, not literally as I was walking, but as part of the project of walking, I did a lot of research investigating the histories that have led to these conditions in these places. And so the walking was an act of witness, also of research and motion. Sometimes I would see things and try to figure out why it looked that way and then go look it up. Sometimes I would read things first and then walk through them and, and see see things confirmed. And while I walked, I made this garment. It's a it's in the cut of a traditional Korean dress. It's made out of denim, uh, which is not a traditional fabric. And I wanted to place myself in the landscape, not as a neutral observer, but as somebody that was implicated in what was happening in these structures and histories of settler colonialism and racial capitalism. I then did similar durational walking projects when I moved back to Chicago and I realized how very little I knew about the place that I had mostly grown up in. These were 20 mile walks, which actually those last five miles makes a big difference. Nine hours is less than 10 or 11 hours. And this was different because many of the neighborhoods and suburbs I was walking through, I had some feelings about, I had some knowledge of, or experience of, or had heard things about. That was different than Detroit, where I really, I had no preconceived notions of any kind of what to expect. All of these projects involved a lot of research, as I said. There's been different iterations that I've tried to figure out how to share that research. For this, I ended up doing a series of Instagram posts for each walk that later I wrote into a chapter in an anthology. I've also done installations and performative lectures and videos and tried all kinds of ways. Another place I did just two uh, durational walks during a residency in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is a very different landscape of colonization and racism than the Midwest. It was my first time in the Southwest. I, I learned a lot about what colonization looks like when a place has been multiply layered with impositions of domination and also very different very different landscape. As I was doing these, I wanted to figure out ways to involve people more directly in the walking experience. And so I've done some projects inviting other people to experience walks as well. And this ended up being the my thesis project at Cranbrook. For those of you who have ever heard of it or been there, it's a very large campus that has several educational institutions on it. And a long history, you know, long for the U.S., of being a place of a very careful design. It's known for its arts and crafts architecture. The entire 300 acres was very carefully landscaped to look natural. And so I created a series of audio recordings that looks at that history. And any place in the U.S. where you're looking at place and the histories of place, you know, I really had to learn about the indigenous histories. I think, you know, we're we're in a time where more and more non-native people are in that journey of learning. And this was definitely part of my journey and has been still, is using walking as a way to learn about native folks wherever I am. This is a picture from one of those walks there. And this is a transcript of some of the audio. It starts with looking at the Native people in that place and sort of weaves in that story throughout. When I got back to Chicago after this experience in Detroit, one of my focuses was really learning about Native people 
both in the past and also in the present. This was not a community I knew anything about when I was growing up there. There really was nothing taught in history at any school that I attended there. Chicago is on Lake Michigan. All of it is green space. Everyone loves it. It's all landfill, which most people don't know. Uh, technically, it could be considered unceded native land um, because all of the treaties, the border stopped at the shoreline. And so all of that landfill, which is now beaches and parks and a lakefront trail, is unceded. So when I got back to Chicago, I started learning about that and thinking about that. And I was able to work with a number of Native folks to put together this group walk, a procession really, in the heart of downtown. So uh, to the right of that red line, that red line is the route of the walk. To the right is Grant Park, which is this amazing, you know, wonderful civic asset and also technically unceded native land. And so we wanted to mark that boundary with, which we did with a line of red sand along the sidewalk, 1600 pounds of red sand I took. I was very fortunate to be able to build and use this project as a way to build relationships with native people who wanted to work on this together. And that since translated into my most recent project, again, looking at the shoreland and really, really trying to understand the nature of its manufacture and its construction over time as an example of settler engineering. This is a map of all of the landfill, every single little piece over time. This is also an audio walk. It's a series of audio recordings that draws excerpts from all the lawsuits and legislation and treaties that has made this construction of land possible. And then contrasting, yeah, so many, so much planning and manipulation that's gone into trying to create this land and that has made this land. And then contrasting that with um, interviews I did with Native folks who work on the environment and history and tribal preservation, historic preservation, and languages who each talked about Indigenous perspectives on land and water. And so the audio recordings as a whole, I think, hopefully what they end up as is this contrast of languages, looking at the language that has created the shoreline that we think we see and contrasting that with the language of reciprocity and uh, mutual respect from an Indigenous worldview. So as I said, the research that underlines all of these projects is not immediately evident by looking. And so I have found different ways of sharing it. One is a self-published book about all the Detroit projects. The other ways of walking is an anthology that has the chapter about the 100 miles in Chicagoland project. And then Who's Lakefront, which is the project with the line of red sand, has its very own website with information both about the project, but really about the conditions that have made this strip of unceded land possible. So, yeah, I am excited to continue to walk here at Sitka. Thank you so much again for this opportunity. It's already been incredible. And, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Gian, for sharing your work and your practice with us. Thank you so much. Our next presenter is Elsie McCullough. Elsie shares stories using words, photographs, illustrations, mosaics, and seeds. She has a Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Studies and an MA in Native American Religious Traditions, both from UC Santa Barbara. She has taught writing and world religions at Great Basin College in Nevada, through her web journal, Somewhere Out West, she explores what it's like living in a place where jackrabbits often outnumber people. Much of her creative work focuses on revitalizing the traditional ecological knowledge of her multiracial ancestors. Please welcome Elsie to the Sitka Center. Thank you, Allison. I'm excited to be back at the Sitka Center. I was invited to come here um, back in 2010 and at that time, I was living in Winnemucca, Nevada, in northern Nevada. And um, this story, uh, the project I'm working on now actually started at that time when I first came here. And so I was going to tell you a little story about how it came to be. Um, and Winnemucca has a great library. It's a pretty small town, but the librarian is pretty amazing. 
And one day I came across this big monstrous book in the middle of the library there. And it's called Fishes and Fisheries of Nevada. And I just, I know about the kokanee salmon um, in the Eastern Sierra. So I thought, okay, I'm just gonna look up and see what it says about salmon. So I opened the book and under salmon, to my surprise, <clears throat> there's a whole section on king salmon or Chinook salmon and how they historically were found in the upper reaches of the Owyhee River in Northern Nevada. And I just, it blew me away. I couldn't imagine this. I mean, th that part of Nevada, if you've ever been there, it's like sagebrush and maybe some aspen trees and very like dry, high country. Um, and so I kind of put that away and thought, well, that's pretty amazing. I don't know how those fish got there, but apparently they did. And then um, I was invited to come to Sitka and I took kind of a roundabout way getting from Winnemucca to here and went to Astoria on the way. And the reason I had done that was because my grandfather had told us the story about my his father, my great great grandfather, when he was 13, he and his parents came to Portland. Um, this was in the 1880s on a steamer from San Diego. And the story was they had come up uh, along the coast. And when they got off the shore of um, the Columbia River, they were hit by a big storm, gale force winds. And um, you, as probably everybody knows uh, who's from here anyway, you can't come up the Columbia and get over the sandbar when the, the weather's like that. So the boat had to stay offshore there for three days while this gale blew through. And my great grandfather, the 13 year old was the only one who wasn't seasick. And so he took care of the whole family. So eventually this gale blew off, blew by and they safely made it over the sandbar and got to Portland. And um, that's where my grandfather was born years later. And I always remember this story. So I wanted to go to Astoria and go to the mouth of the Columbia and just see where this had taken place. And um, cause I, I just love stories that my grandfather used to tell like that. And, and so I had gone to Astoria, but of course this was like around Thanksgiving and this terrible storm was going in Astoria. It was probably just like the one that kept the boat out there for three days bad winds. It was raining cats and dogs and elk and seals and everything. This The place is just, the streets are running with water. I'm downtown going, okay, well, forget going out to the jetty today. So I just ducked into this um, antique store as it turned out to get out of the squall that was happening and was just kind of drying off and wandering around. And I... First of all, I found on one of the shelves, this salmon, which is really wonderfully hand carved. I think it might be soapstone um, by somebody. And I just thought, wow, that is a really cool salmon. So I have this salmon in one hand as I'm wandering around this store. And then um, I'm married to a photographer. So I always pay attention to old photographs. And I was then um, looking through a basket of old pictures. And I came across this other picture, which maybe you can see. Um, it's a postcard of Mountain City, Nevada, which is right up where the fisheries book had said that salmon were last seen in the Bull Run Mountains of Northern Nevada on the upper Owyhee River. So I'm there at the mouth of the Columbia and I realize I have this salmon in one hand and this picture of Nevada in the other. And these two things actually go together. And I realized, you know, I need to figure out how they did that. I need to trace that route from the mouth all the way to the headwaters because I it just blows me away. It's over 900 miles. It's an elevation gain of like 6,000 feet. I mean, it's a huge journey. And 
how can an animal do that? So when I got to Sitka, I was just thinking about that, even though that wasn't what I had planned to come and work on, but it just sort of um, was a spark that wouldn't let me go. But it did just sort of um, germinate, I guess, back there for many years. And I didn't think about it really again until this summer when I was um, getting more and more interested in how the Klamath dams were actually coming out for the salmon on the Klamath River. And people were starting to talk more and more about possibly taking out dams on the lower snake for the salmon runs. So I was like, wow, this is really kind of time, I think. I should go do this trip and figure out what how they did this. So this summer I made two different trips and I actually ended up starting out at the headwaters of the Owyhee and working downstream like the young salmon would do. But um, all along this amazing way, there's just stories that really um, helped me understand what it was like and um, what, since these salmon runs up the Owyhee are extinct because of dams that were built with no way for the fish to get past them, um, these stories in a way can be really sad because you think about what you've missed by being alive now rather than, you know, a hundred years ago. But I also think about it as what we could regain if we give the salmon a chance and get out of their way. And so I brought a couple of the little short stories to read to you about what people said that kind of helped me understand just the magnitude of what these runs were like. And this one's from Linda Minas. Um, she's from Warm Springs. At Celilo Falls, the energy of the water was really powerful. I could feel the mist spray in my face, even if you stood far away. The falls had a roar that was so loud you could hear it for miles and miles away. Even in the next town over, the Dalles, you could hear it. It was an echo you could feel in your heart. And then the smell of the falls, you could smell the salmon, the saltiness of it. It smelled so fresh. There was also the smell of salmon cooking. It was beautiful. And then another one, this is from Elmer Crow, who is a Nimipu elder. And this was also took place at Salilo. And my dad woke me up and it was dark yet. Come on, son, let's go. The fish are coming. Took me outside the tent, said, listen. It sounded like a thousand people with an oar beating on the water. It was the salmon coming up the river. And then another one from a Nimipu elder. This is Wilf Wil Wilfred Scott, his memories about fishing. It says, we used to fish for salmon off the big rocks on the Amnaha River. There were times when we could catch a Chinook that was so big that all you could do was lay down on your belly on the rock and just hold on while the salmon tried to get away. And this one was from an old timer who lived up above the Hell's Canyon on the, on the Snake River, so kind of near the Boise area. He said, I could tell you, I could tell when the salmon came back, the river would change color. Instead of looking blue green, it would be almost black with schools of fish. And then further up on the Owyhee, uh, archeologists have actually found salmon bones, Chinook salmon bones in caves that could be as old as 7,000 years old. And so obviously salmon have been uh, migrating up there for a very, very long time. And um, there are early records from Elk Papers in Elko and some of the other mining camps like Tuscarora that mention about how the indigenous people would come into town with wagon loads of salmon to sell. Um, one time, they, this is in 1873, an Indian brought in a wagon load of salmon trout from the Owyhee on Tuesday 
and retailed them out at 10 cents a pound. So then there's one more little quote. This is from um, the man who was an, a ranger, a forest service ranger up near Tuscarora, which is near Mountain City in that northern part of Nevada. Um, and this dates from, let's see, he says, I remember the run of 1887. Those fish even went up that little stream that runs down through Tuscarora. It dried up completely, completely in the latter part of July, but when it was high in the spring, the salmon could go up. Old Jess Snyder went out with a pitchfork one day, and right down there under the bridge, he saw one spawning. He just put the pitchfork under it and heaved it on the bank. The fish weighed about 30 pounds. So that was, those are the kinds of stories that I wanted to tell so that people could really get sort of a, a, a sense of what it was like and what it could be like. And I usually write, that's my main um, artistic expression, but I felt like in this case, there's been so many wonderful books about this subject, and yet it hasn't been enough yet to bring these salmon back, the wild salmon. So I thought, well, how could I reach people who maybe aren't into reading books? You know, how could I sort of bring these stories into a bigger audience? And we just so happened to go to a, a show at the Art Museum in Portland that was on um, these beautiful Japanese uh art pieces that incorporated text, in most cases poetry, with illustration. And usually this was on vertical scrolls that hung on walls and there'd be poetry and a, and a beautiful painting with it. But one of the pieces that I saw was called an imaki, which is a horizontal scroll that unrolled to, you know, pretty long, like maybe 20 feet long. And these were meant to be read as books where you would just unroll parts of it at a time and look at the illustrations and read the text and keep unrolling as the story went along. But of course, at the museum, they had to have the whole thing unrolled so that we could walk along the text and read it as we went. And I saw that scroll and I thought, that's the perfect way to tell this story because you could really portray the whole river along the length of this piece and people could walk and, and kind of read the stories as they went and see the pictures as they went along the scroll. So that's the project that I am bringing to Sitka this, this time is to try to figure out how to uh, create this scroll. And I picked um, silk as the medium on which to do it because it's very strong, but very light. And it can be painted on, it can be quilted, it can be stamped, it can be um, uh, just inked on, there's just embellished lots of different things. And so I've been sort of experimenting while I'm here to figure out just how to make this work. So one of the first things that happened was I got here um, when there was a big windstorm and all over the place there were alder branches all just on the ground and lots and lots of, of lichen. And so I began uh, picking up lichen and you probably, lots of you probably recognize this. This is um, just uh, light, kind of uh, pale green. And I got the idea that I could try dyeing some of the silk and see what happened because I knew about uh, lichen was supposedly a good natural dye. So that was sort of one of the first experiments was taking the lichen. And to my surprise, this is what came out was this amazing, beautiful orange. And so I got very excited about that. And the next thing that happened like two days later is we had the ice storm and all these alder trees fell down. And so um, we had to like cut branches off of one of them to get our cars out and stuff like that. And 
um, Sherrod, who was here last month and gave a presentation, um, the man who's a carver, he said, well, you know, I think I've heard that the inner bark of the alder trees would is making makes a dye. And so we gathered up, um, this is like alder on the outside. I hope you can see that. It's white, but on the inside of the red alders, this is the, the actual wood, but this part here is the red inner bark. When it's exposed to oxygen, it turns this really pretty reddish orange. And so that was another, that, that went in the dye pot too. <laughs> and we came out with another really cool orange. This kind, it comes out all kind of confetti color patterned, which is really fun. And so in that case, we actually got pretty much the same color as the dye material, but you just never know what's going to happen. So that's kind of where it all started um, here at Sitka. And I'm continuing to just experiment with different ways of creating it. And, and um, I've had the scroll all out on the studio, on the tables, drafting, sketching, like how different pictures and things that were going to happen there. And it's been just an amazing experience to think about um, how the land can actually give you materials to, to use in your art, how art can be um, really as as low on the carbon footprint as you can make it by uh, just recycling. In the case of the silk, I bought some, um, it's been cut out of old kimonos that were being repurposed. And so the liners were just plain white silk. And so that's been a great source uh, for the raw materials for my project. And, um, uh, yes, I did finally make it back to the mouth of the Columbia right before another storm came in, but fortunately it was about eight hours before it hit, and I did get to see my the, <laughs> the site of my grandfather's story and really understand just what a crazy place the mouth of the Columbia is. And so um, I'm just very grateful to have an opportunity to be here and uh find my way on this project. And I hope that uh, one day I'll be able to share, share it all with you out in community. So thank you. Thank you so much, Elsie, for sharing your journey, showing us your very recent uh, natural dye experiments. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our final speaker of the evening. Fran is a lost engineer and a renewed writer. She was the editor of Stone Fence Review at Dartmouth College and is returning to writing poetry and exploring fiction after a decade as a mechanical engineer. Her work draws inspiration from that time away, the natural world, historical events, linguistics, and identity. She has previously been published in Sky Island Journal and Plain China. Fran, we're so pleased that your creative journey includes Sitka. Welcome. Thank you for that introduction, Allison. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Fran. And uh, some of the things that I came to Sitka to work on are my poetry, uh, some photography, and also to just sort through the feeling that I don't actually know what I'm doing. So I'm really grateful to Sitka for taking a chance on me and allowing me the space to try and figure that out. As Allison mentioned, when I was in school, I majored in engineering and biology, um, but also I minored in English. Logistically, that just meant that I was always late to class because those buildings are not next to each other, but it meant that I also had the opportunity to play across different ways of thinking, you know, going from my thermodynamics lecture to dissection lab and then over to my poetry workshop. Um, after school, I pretty much gave up writing. I just didn't have the time. I didn't have the emotional capacity for it. And about a year ago, I started to come back to writing. Um, but as such, I don't really have a process in place, nor do I really have a body of work to share with you all. And so instead, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about this phrase, artist residency. So the Oxford English Dictionary has a pretty obvious definition of what residence is. Um, it's like a place where you reside, dwell, or have an abode. And so this view is actually where I've been residing and working for the past month. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, Oxford also has 
what I think is like a more interesting historical definition, which they caveat as, quote, probably to settle, establish, or bring home the true character or ulterior significance of, to place in context. Um, I think that's a really dramatic and existential definition, but I do really like that last part, which is to place in context. Uh, for me, context is this framework that we use to interact with and understand the, what's happening around us, the environment around us. And when we have a change in that context, it gives us the contrast to actually bring some of those details that we would otherwise miss um, to the front, forefront of what we're working on or thinking about. And I think that's really why this residency has felt so refreshing to me. So prior to Sitka though, I was in Pakistan. I was in two cities, Lahore and Karachi. Both of them are these immense, dense, urban spaces. And when I was reflecting back on my time there, I actually think I was never more than three meters away from another human being in the entire time that I was there. And I loved it. Um, being in such a dense place, I spent a lot of time thinking about space and how limitations in space shapes so many of the interactions that we have with each other and with what's going on around us. So my time in Pakistan was really beautiful and there's so many things that happened there and I don't have the time to cover all of them. So instead I wanted to focus on a single incident. Um, it's actually very mundane, um, literally pedestrian, uh, but it really struck, it really stuck with me as a moment where space shapes the interaction between people. So in those two cities, um, there is really minimal uh, traffic infrastructure, but really maximal traffic. Um, and so what happens is that as a pedestrian, you're in this, what well, I considered it beautiful, but this beautiful, chaotic and slightly dangerous interaction all the time. Um, this photo is like a very mild version of what streets looked like. But every time I went to go and cross a street, you kind of just, you kind of have faith that you just step out into this tiniest gap and you hope that as you're stepping, the next spot is gonna open up for you and you're just gonna make it through. And as you're walking, you trust that the people behind you are going to miss you as they, you know, instantly rush into the space that you've just vacated. So it's a lot of trust. And it's actually a lot of connectedness that I felt there, which was very cool. None of it is orchestrated, right? Every person is just trying to get to where they're going. But together, there's this massive swirl and we're all moving and everything is working just fine. Just don't stop. And in one of these moments, as I'm crossing the street, I'm walking and this motorcycle just rips in front of me. And the passenger is a woman. And as they ride by, she has a shawl on and she kind of flips her shawl to adjust it. And as they ride by, the shawl corner brushes my arm, like the lightest touch. And it's such a small, small detail, but I've spent a lot of time thinking about that tiny interaction as I cross the street. So I got to Sitka. And I spent some time thinking about that, but now in the context of this nature that's around me, you know, I'm walking, I see the juncos flying, I think about all the little fish swimming together, kind of how Elsie was describing, and uh, noticing all these details and patterns around me, but at the same time thinking about this thing that just happened. So there are these, there are engineering laws and models that represent swarm intelligence, and I'm, I'm not an expert in that by any means. But, you know, in that model, each agent or individual has their own goal. And when they're all together, even though they have a simple goal, together they have this super complex behavior that they exhibit. And so this, this sum is greater than parts is considered emergence in this model. And while I'm here at Sitka, you know, I've been granted the space to think about these really normally disparate things, you know, urban sprawl versus biological phenomena versus mathematical models. In being able to think about these together, I feel like they've had their own emergence. So to reference that Oxford definition again, I feel like I've been able to settle, establish, or bring home the true character or ulterior significance of that moment in Lahore and write about it and what it meant to me. So that brings me back to the other half of that original phrase, which is the word artist or writer. It's a word that I've grappled with for a long time in a good way. I've always written, but I've never considered myself a writer. And I've actually taken great pains to keep my writing life separate from what I considered my professional life. But I think here amongst all these other artists who are each their own multitude, 
I've been wondering what it would mean to have both and bring those two closer to each other. And so in the spirit of bringing home the true character, but this time for myself, I'm gonna end by sharing two poems. Swarm intelligence. A small flip of water is a fish slipping through the space left by another, each an agent of its own scale, deciding by the oldest, simplest rules where and how to go. We put ourselves into everything, wanting so much to take or to know, when all it takes is to slip into the surge and snarl of traffic, each step into the impossible gap between a truck and a bike, absolute trust in the rickshaw shooting through the space left behind. And in the swirl, a trailing shawl is a soft fin brushing skin, a perfect movement wrapped around another. The second poem actually comes out of some of the details that I've seen here, um, some of these photos here, uh, but also out of a New Yorker article that a friend sent to me when I came up here. Um, it was a pretty dramatic article about the big one and about tsunamis. So I hope that my uh, poem doesn't come across as pessimistic or catastrophic. Cascadia subduction zone. What's left to say about the ocean it hasn't said for itself? From this distant window, waves fold themselves languidly, combing the air for gifts to take home, murmuring soft exclamations. Look what we found, isn't it lovely? The neighbors below are arguing, North America and Juan de Fuca plates smashing together. In a year or later today, one of them will sigh and say, I'm sorry, my love, it's so small a thing, and they will shift and settle. And it is so small a thing, all of this being here, twin flower runners clipping the ground into place, the spruce gathering up her fringe of moss. Will they be enough to hold everything when the water comes back? Not a wave, but the whole ocean here to explore these hills and touch the wet fern, saying it's all new, but not so different from when we were here last. And with that, I want to thank the Sitka Center and all the other residents for the amazing experience that I've had here. And I also want to thank everybody for shaping me as a person going forward. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Fran, for sharing your reflections and wonderful poems. Uh, it's always moving to be read aloud to by an author in their own voice. So thank you, Dennis, Leo, Gian, Elsie, and Fran for taking us inside your practices this evening. I am excited for you to see how this space will help shape your work and your interactions with each other. My favorite parts of these talks are always the through lines that emerge that we couldn't have ever planned. Uh, just so excited to have you all here together at the same time. So thank you, uh, everyone who presented. Thank you, Sitka community, for tuning in. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Good night, everyone. <laughs>